A very good day to each and every one of you and welcome once again to a very special edition of Caribbean Spotlight. And in our studios, we're very privileged and honored to have uh, with us uh, Mr. David Granger, Brigadier David Granger, who is the presidential candidate of the APNU AFC Coalition for the upcoming elections in Guyana, which is scheduled for May 11th. And uh, also to my extreme right is Mr. Moses Nagamutu. Uh, he's a prominent attorney at law and he's also um, the uh, Prime Minister candidate for the APNU AFC coalition as well. So we want to thank uh, thank both of you gentlemen and welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you. It's a yes. pleasure coming here. Yes, absolutely. Well, I did interview Mr. Granger uh, a few months ago and uh, it's my first time interviewing Mr. Nagamutu and I think it's the most appropriate time to have both of you uh, sitting down and really addressing the core issues and concerns of the, um, the Guyanese diaspora here in New York. Um, as we all know, elections is a very important, um, you know, moment in, in the lives of all Guyanese, whether you live there or whether you're living abroad. Uh, we're still very connected to what's happening in Guyana. And so we're going to ask both of you some core questions um, that the Guyanese people at large would like you to address. And uh, the first question I'm going to ask is Mr. Granger, but then, of course, Mr. Nagamut, you can interject as well as, uh, as, you, as you feel, uh, you know, when you need to. Uh, the first question is, um, many people do have concerns about the decline of the sugar industry and the rice industry in Guyana. Um, should you win the elections, should you take office as the president of Guyana in the upcoming elections, what would you do to revive the sugar and the rice industry? Well, first of all, let me explain that both industries are essential to the Guyanese economy. And in the case of the sugar industry, which is, of course, our oldest industry, we are not going to destroy the sugar industry. We're not going to let down sugar workers. What we want to see is an efficient industry. We want the industry to be turned around. There are managerial problems in the industry. There are labor problems. There are equipment problems. And we are aware of all of these problems. AP and U and AFC have collaborated over the last three years in the National Assembly and we have called for a turnaround plan. We want to save sugar, we want to shave the livelihoods of sugar workers, but we want a plan. And we are not going to be led by the nose, by the present administration or by any other administration um, into pumping money into an industry which is badly managed. We are convinced that the sugar industry could be saved and that is a commitment from APNU and AFC. Moses. Well, first of all, I think that we will be interested in the forensic audit of what happened in the sugar industry. And uh, David is quite right. Our concern is about job security. There are 18,000 families, sugar workers and their families, who depend upon the survival of the sugar industry. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the government has spent 47 billion Guyana dollars on rehabilitation of the sugar industry. The Skelton factory, it has not been successful. We have also pumped 17 billion dollars as bailout from the parliament to help the sugar workers and this came with the solid support from the opposition because we know how critical sugar is for Guyana but we also want to review to reform and rehabilitate sugar and to diversify the sugar industry to be able to bring ethanol to be able to introduce aquaculture into the part and parcel of the sugar industry so that you don't have a total loss of job security with regards to the uh, do it with, um, the rice industry, we know that rice, in terms of volume, uh, there has been the increase in production. But simultaneously, there has been the fall in the price for paddy from $8,000 per bag to now $2,005, $3,000 per bag. We want to examine the, uh, the deal we have with Venezuela to see whether the price that is being paid by Venezuela is being passed on mm -hmm. to the uh, paddy producers. As we speak, there are protests right now in Esquibo. People have not been paid for one or two crops, and it is causing ruination among rice farmers. So our concern is, yes, these are the livelihood and the food uh, security for our nation mm -hmm. and the new government which I'm confident we will form on May uh, 12th of this year would be uh, interested to examine the question of the price for sh uh, rice and to create new markets alternative markets as well but there is a big uh, we believe 
rip off of the uh, paddy producers right now by the GRDB. We want rice farmers to be totally in control of this industry. We don't want the government to have interference uh, with regards to the pricing and who export rice. So to an extent privatizing to. that industry? It is, a private, it is privatized, but you need <coughs> to be able to have the work, the, the paddy farmers uh, uh, representatives mm -hmm. with rice millers to take control and not the middleman, the GRDB with some uh, political cronies. They have their friends who are in charge for shipping of the rice. They have a commission. They set up a fund called the Social Fund. Nobody benefits from that. That's the friends that's supposed to uh, benefit. A farmer is supposed to have uh, cheap fertilizers. We're supposed to look into the uh, factor of drainage and irrigation. These are some of the essential things for the sustenance of sugar and rice. So I believe that we have to change the matrix with which mm -hmm. we look at the two critical industries. You know, Mr. Granger, there is a rising concern of child abuse, domestic violence in Guyana. It's becoming, it has become an epidemic in, in, in our country. And there are a lot of concerns. Um, yes, there, there are policies in place um, by the, the ministries, the various ministries. Um, but people still feel that um, uh, enough, there's not, enough is not being done. Um, it's just a lot of policies in place, but they're not reaching out to the homes um, that are really affected by child abuse, domestic violence, and especially even uh, these shelters and orphanages. Um, yes, they're fed three, three meals a day, but there, there are no psychological counseling for these children that have been emotionally, physically, mentally abused. Um, what can you say um, that, that, you know, that you would do once you take office? to okay. rectify and to remedy the situation? Well, there are two elements, the enforcement element, and there is, of course, the education element. <coughs> as far as education is concerned, we do admit that the schools, the churches, mandirs, the masjid need to play a more important role, the, certainly the homes, in the ch upbringing of children. But extreme poverty in the country has contributed to um, a reduction in the family solidarity and the uh, relationships between parents and children. That is a major factor and we will not solve that factor until we deal with poverty and rebuilding families. But as far as the enforcement side is concerned, the police force is weak and uh, I was a member of the Discipline Forces Commission 11 years ago and some recommendations have been made. The police force has not been substantially reformed. There are over 15 recommendations from the British government and other international agencies. But the government, for some reason or the other, has never enforced those um, recommendations. The result is the police force is very weak. It's underpaid. There are not enough female police officers who can deal sympathetically um, with uh, matters like domestic violence. Um, there is not enough equipment, um, for example, to ensure that there is uh, a reduction in trafficking in persons. There is too much armed um, robbery uh, because of the influx of uh, weapons into the country. And the police force, quite frankly, right now is not prepared to enforce the law, whether it is in other criminal matters such as piracy or banditry or domestic violence. That force has got to be re-equipped, refinanced, retrained if it's going to make an impact on the matters you raise here. So we need to pay attention to both aspects. One is the law enforcement aspect and secondly is the education aspect. There are serious social problems in Guyana which come out of the fact that there is a major um, failure of governance and the education system is failing our children and this is where many of the problems occur. I know persons involved in uh, remedial education, people who try to run uh, primary schools um, <coughs> and many of the concerns affecting those uh, proprietors or teachers our concerns of domestic violence, incest, rape at home, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and it is not a, an ethnic problem, it is not a geographical problem, it's becoming widespread. Mm -hmm. So we need to regard um, the question of domestic violence in a holistic manner. It's not just a matter of policing alone, we need to look at the social issues which are causing domestic violence as well. But what, what specifically would you implement in rectifying this epidemic? Well, I'm walking on two legs. One leg is the enforcement leg, that is strengthen the police force, retrain the police force, re-equip the police force, and the second is examine the education system to ensure that it can give support to households. When a child um, is ready to come to school, that child must be given transportation, that child has to be given breakfast, that child has to be given counseling in mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And unless you can deal with children at that level, you will not um, be able to create the type of 
independent adults that the education system should generate. And that is a big problem. Yeah, you know, recently, uh, Mr. Nagamuta, I interviewed the founder of um, the, the Lusignan Good Hope Learning Center in Ghana, which is an after-school type facility um, that helps the children, you know, to have, uh, you know, learn, teach them how to read and write. Many kids that are that are in Ghana don't even know how to read and write. So this uh, this mm -hmm. found this learning center was actually founded by a Guyanese who lives here in in America and thought that there was a need to really have many of these types of facilities. And some of the issues that she identified from the kids was domestic violence and um, starvation. They would not mm -hmm. get meals at home. So her facility provides meals provides education, uh, provides, you know, ethic counseling for them, ethical counseling, um, all kinds of uh, services. Um, w would these types of facilities, do you feel um, that the government, if you, if you're a AP, AP, and you and AFC should take government, would you be able to subsidize some of us, you know, these types of facilities so that we have many more of these types of facilities? Listen, this is a country that says, a government that says that people are happy. Well, happy people don't commit suicide. Um, David has been saying this at uh, several of our functions now. Happy people do not turn to prostitution. Happy people do not beg in the streets. And we have ha had a history of that over many, many years. So you have a social dilemma. You have a social scourge. This is a government that spends $2 million, $3 million on a minister <laughs> to repair uh, his or her teeth. So money is not a problem. The question is policies. How do you direct the scarce resources of the state to address some of these things? For example, we have a drugs problem in Guyana. Many young people are serving their teenage years in jail, the best part of their life in jail. Mm -hmm. We have very few, if any, functioning drugs rehabilitation center. And that would also take care if you are able to reform and rehabilitate young people who have fallen on the wayside, then you will be able to address all the deviant behavior of crime, right. etc. Because rehab so centers are so, so much needed, these after school programs. Yeah, so uh, we, we applaud Guyanese and their friends who would come to Guyana and they will start programs that will address some of these social issues. Uh, Guyana is crying out, the domestic violence that takes place, uh, a lot of alcoholism, uh, um, one uh, single parent depending on somebody to finance their livelihood and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Question goes back to the fundamental issue of our economy. Is our economy uh, creating sustainable livelihood for people? Do we have enough jobs? Do we have just a government that spends money only on repairing and fixing roads and infrastructure and not being in industries, not opening land for agriculture, not creating opportunities, vocational training for young people? And so it goes back to the issue of what kind of planning we have, what is the vision we have for the new economy of Guyana so that people are meaningfully employed. So. If you look at it in a very isolated way, you may be able to do very little uh, to transform the existing situation. David spoke about poverty. 30% of our people are, we don't have all the statistics, statistics, but we are trying to gather these, are in extreme situation of poverty. 25% perhaps are unemployed. Now, what kind of a government do you have in these last years telling us about the great development in Guyana when the social fabric of the country is falling apart. Now should APNU and AFC take government come May 12th, what would you do? What strategy would you implement to create jobs for the people of Guyana, to increase uh, the minimum wage levels, to give them a better way of life? Well, specifically, um, we do not see that there's going to be an influx of people into the public services. We are aiming at job creation, particularly through the education system. We've got to modify the education system in order to encourage more entrepreneurs. Um, young people um, must be able to start up their businesses, and that is one area that we will explore much further. Secondly, we have promised that there will be a technical institute in every single region of Guyana and an agricultural institute. This will give young people the type of training 
um, that will enable them to embark on their on careers within their own regions. Guyana is an agricultural country, and people should not have to be drifting across the border to Brazil or Suriname or Venezuela looking, you know, for money uh, to work in, you know, in, in, a, in, you know, farms and restaurants. So the whole idea is to encourage young people to be self-employed, and uh, in the middle term, we will be establishing agricultural and technical institutes. Secondly, we will be encouraging more agro-processing. Everything we can produce in Guyana, peanuts into peanut butter, mangoes into juices and chunks, uh, avocado pears, these are things which could be packaged, in, um, exported to the Eastern Caribbean, and we expect to have an export-driven economy. And young people will be able to get employment, not by looking for government jobs, but by um, pursuing agro-processing. In addition to that, we see young people um, going into science and technology. Guyana is a country that you know, cries out for development, for roads and bridges and highways. And we see that the education system, if it turns more in favor of STEM, science, technology, and engineering and mathematics, would be able to give young people long-lasting careers. But we need to change the education system to encourage young people to uh, go into entrepreneurial um, uh, pursuits without depending on waged labor. I think that has been the downfall of the old system. The new system would be one based on entrepreneurship. Now, based on, um, you know, uh, there's so many young, bright people in Guyana. Um, do, you, do you feel the government will be able to support scholarship programs to further educate these kids out of Guyana where they can come back and really contribute to their country in a, in a more meaningful no, way? That, I, I don't agree that's the way. I, we I, have to fix the University of Guyana. Yeah. I don't believe the scholarship programs outside of Ghana um, would be a successful means of training the mass Because by the University of Ghana doesn't have all these various degree the, the, programs the in The problem place. is the University of Ghana has been kept weak and small for too long. And um, we will not solve the problem if we postpone the rectification of the issues facing University of Ghana right now. We have to fix University of Ghana. It's too important and uh, it's been neglected, it's been underfunded, it's if you look at the libraries, the laboratories, the staffing, um, you'll realize why Guyanese education system is in such a, um, a, a plight. And we have to fix UG. And UG is going to be the way forward for those young people, not foreign scholarships. Now, the, the, um, the concern for the educators in Ghana is that their salaries are so low. And because of that, there is no motivation. Um, in the public school system compared to the private schools, the level of education is like night and day from what I'm told. Um, do you plan to increase the wages of these educators that, that are so crucial for the, 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 the foundation of our young people in molding their minds? Mm -hmm. But if they're not motivated because of, of low salaries um, mm -hmm. and, and their skills, you know, lacking the skills uh, sure. to teach effectively, um, how can they uh, in turn um, positively affect the lives and, and the, the young minds of the, pe of the young children? Well, that's a very Im important question. Uh, both the Jagdeo <coughs> government and the Ramatar governments, they are now known as the 5% government. Mm -hmm. We are voting for 10 and 13% across the board wage increase for public servants, for <coughs> teachers, for nurses, and for policemen and women and other uh, people in the public service. They have money to take contracted employees, which is done on a selective basis. It's ruining the public service and uh, the system of meritocracy. And they're always saying they don't have enough money to give not only salaries. Uh, certainly, we would want to see as a start uh, resources being guarded from areas that they're wasting money right now uh, to direct the teachers. You have to motivate them. So money is important, but you also have to give them incentives. Absolutely. There are teachers who want to teach in the interior who don't have incentives. There are uh, all kind of cronies and friends of the government, government who are benefiting from duty-free concessions. We need to expand that. We need to expand in terms of housing facilities, housing grants, housing loans, particularly targeting public wages uh, for nurses and teachers are critical. Many of our women, however, in Guyana are now forced to go into what you call guard duty. They're watch women. You don't have so many watch men. And these are the low paying jobs. And so we need to create environment where you could have uh, the public assistance for single mothers. 
you could help more women, you could be able to stimulate, as David was saying, uh, um, small cottage industries. Unfortunately, the answer to this uh, issue is to be able to attract, not to externalize uh, your education system, to send peop more people outside, but to be able to attract people who are outside right now who could come back to Guyana and they could give quality service to the education sector because education we have to have a knowledge driven society ICT must become a word that is used in the home children must be, grow up in the morning feeling that they have access to a computer they can create their own applications we should be able to diversify and make our young people marketable by introducing compulsory Portuguese Spanish uh, along with English for a start and so we have to be able to look at Guyana uh, as a country that has needs. Why should we in this age and time have students in the university striking whether they have functioning toilets? Th this is disgraceful and the new government, I've been a teacher, Granger has been a teacher um, and we came out of teaching uh, environment where we think that the quality and worth of a young people is what would be needed to create a new society. Right. So it starts at home. We have to find the money. And I understand the government has been boasting how much money it has been voting uh, for in the social sector, in education, in health and housing. But really and truly over the last few years, the, the, the percentage of the vote uh, in relation to the budget, the overall allocation, it has dropped. It has not increased. So we are creating a sham that a lot of money is going into social services in Guyana, but really and truly, we have to invest in quality, not quanto, how much you spend, but what is the result and where you're spending the money. Yeah, well, a Just lot of... Let me mention two yes, points sure. uh, to support what Moses has been saying. Both he, both he and I are, are graduates of University of Ghana, and that's why we still have faith in university. For one, I have promised that teachers will be the best paid public servants on mm. the AP and UAFC administration, and I'm now going back on that. Teachers will be the best paid public servants. And secondly, I said, they, every teacher must be given a laptop. I don't believe that the one laptop a family um, uh, project is the way to go at this time in Guyanese history. And on my own campaign, every time I go out into the hinterland, I make sure that I have some electronic device to present to a headmistress. We have to move the entire education system into the information technology age, and that hasn't happened. So I do agree with you. Um, teaching is important, and it is vital if we are going to transform the not only the education system, but also the economy of Ghana. Yeah, because uh, the young people are the future of the country. Of they're the, the, the colorful fabric. Mm -hmm. And if they're not educated well and uh, are given the, you know, the personal skills, the, the moral skills to excel, then um, the future of Ghana is definitely doomed. <laughs> I said, I said the, David and I, our new government will be a transition government. We want to hand this country over to young people. Not simply because they're the leaders of the future. They are the leaders now. But we have to spend more time and resources to prepare them. To right. hand them the baton. And, and one leadership. important uh, you know, function that you'll have in government, should you win the elections, would be to really um, get rid of this domestic child abuse violence that's happening because that's affecting the young people. Uh, it's affecting their growth, their development, and um, it, it's really a saddening situation to see that their potential is stifled because of the of the brutality that they encounter in their own homes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we'd like to ask you to really do work on that. That's that's very important. And uh, and speaking of both of you, I can feel that commitment. Yes. And. Um, so um, we, we definitely want to, um, to really uh, urge you to have that be on one of your top priority list.
We have a few more questions for uh, Mr. David Granger and Mr. Moses Nagamoto. You're uh, watching a very special interview in the studios of Caribbean Spotlight here in New York City, uh, where we are speaking to the presidential candidate of the APNU AFC coalition and the prime minister ca candidate uh, also of the APNU AFC coalition. As you know, uh, elections in Ghana is upcoming on May 11th, and we uh, thought it would be a, a wonderful opportunity to interview these two gentlemen so they can address, you know, core issues and concerns of the Guyanese, of the Guyanese diaspora. Uh, the other question to you, Mr. Granger, and directed to you specifically, is um, you are the leader of the PNCR. That's correct. And uh, many of the Guyanese um, are asking the question, how different... Uh, is the PNCR of today uh, than it was years ago when Lyndon, Lyndon Forbes, Samson Burnham was the leader then. Uh, many people suffered, crime was very prevalent, many people feared their lives, especially the East Indian community feared their lives. Uh, you know, uh, folks would be just bandits and criminals knocking down their doors, raping their girl children. And back in those days in the 70s and the 80s, people actually fled Guyana who had relatives here fled Guyana, migrated to North America because of the unease of, uh, of the situation in Ghana when it was led by uh, Mr. Forbes uh, Burnham. So again, the question is, how different are your principles as a leader of the PNCR? Um, not that we're, you know, uh, they're e equating you to the principles of Mr. Burnham, uh, but they want to uh, to feel that assurance, especially uh, your, this question will be addressed to the non-PNC supporters. Well, the PNC is a party, it's uh, 58 years old, and I would say that Mr. Burnham has been dead for 30 years. I certainly am not Mr. Burnham, I am a forward-looking politician, and I can tell you that people are fleeing Guyana in, by the thousand now because crime is worse than it was. Um, in fact, uh, the population is dropping, even in Region 6, East Bobby's quarantine, the population is dropping. There's a high rate of suicide, there's a high rate of execution murders and even during Mr. Burnham's era. Um, so I would say that, as far as I'm concerned, the PNC has done much to bring about the situation that we have now, in which we have a government of national unity on the Desmond Height. Um, the PNC reform was founded. The, uh, under Mr. Corbyn, the People's National Congress Reform, One Guyana, was founded. Then I led the APNU, um, that is the Partnership for National Unity, a multi-party coalition. And I am happy to have signed uh, in my own living room with uh, Camera Dramjatan something called the Cummingsburg Accord. It was signed in my house, um, bringing about the first multi-party coalition government in, um, in the history of Guyana. That is a six-party coalition, which has already demonstrated its ability to have a, uh, an electoral majority. This movement has been led and would have been impossible without the PNC. So the PNC of uh, you know 1957 is much different from the PNC of 2015 under David Granger. We're leading Guyana into the future, and I'm proud to have Moses with me. I'm proud to have APNU and AFC together for the first time, taking Guyana forward and giving Guyanese children hope in the future. So I would encourage uh, viewers and listeners to think about the future, think about what the PNC as part of a family of parties can do for their children and for the future. And um, I think that is where um, Guyana is going. I'm very happy and very proud to be here with Moses. And I'm very proud to be able to lead the first multi-party coalition forward um, to improve the conditions under which Guyana um, finds itself at present. I've never in my life seen so much destitution, so much poverty, so much ch um, child abuse, so much um, murder. Um, and uh, so many school dropouts, you know. As I have a saying now that uh, a lot of our children are starting their primary school at on the naming, the on the naming primary school. They're going to the Camp Street Secondary School. They end up at the University of Mazaruni. <laughs> that is the, the big jail. And mm -hmm. seven to five percent of prison inmates are youths. This did not happen 40 or 50 or 30 years ago. There is something happening now in the cooperative republic that is worse than happened 30 or 40 years ago and it's happening under the PPP. Whether it's migration, whether it's suicide, road fatalities, you mentioned it. So let us get a better Guyana and let us have a forward-looking policy and that policy will come from AP and UAFC. Chris Nagamuti, your view on well, that um, statement? I have written quite a lot about uh, what happened in the past and uh, I share your uh, concerns and those of 
your viewers that people still are fearful and uh, still have reservations. I do not expect as we go forward in Guyana that we will have all uh, the people coming over to the view that we need to have a government of national unity. What I want to say, however, is that we are accustomed to looking in our photo albums and as we look into these albums of what happened many years ago, there would be a lot of things there that will give us joy and quite a lot will give us pain. But I suppose that uh, we are not going to be able to change any of those photos, uh, the way they look and the way they appear. What we can do is to turn the new page and look at the blank pages of that album and let us put the selfie with us smiling and let us put uh, what we would want in, in those new pages. So, yes, I can tell you this, that um, much is being said about the past, about the rigging of elections. I wrote about it. Shady Jagan wrote about it. But look, we had a Cold War that uh, people tried to localize and internalize the blame for what happened. But a lot that I experienced is what other bigger players had designed for Guyana during the Cold War. But that did not prevent efforts at national unity. Since the split between two friends, two comrades, Burnham and Chedi Jagan, in 1955, they have never given up on the idea that they could work together. In 1964, Jagan proposed to share the cabinet with Forbes Burnham. They could rotate the, the prime ministership. They could have 50% each in the cabinet. They, in, st uh, in spite of, uh, of what was described as rig elections, um, in 1977, 1975, 76, 77, the two parties cooperated. There was critical support. Who was Jagan supporting and give critical support to in the 70s, in spite of what uh, we had as fraudulent elections? It was the PNC, it was Forbes Burnham. We came very close to merge the two parties in the 70s. And in 1985, before Forbes Burnham died, it was Chedi Jagan's wish that these two parties should come together. Then he was prepared to work with Burnham, Burnham being president, and he would have been prime minister. Today, we have the realization of a historical desire of healing, of reconciliation. And this is what I see symbolizing in David and I. And, uh, and I can tell you this, that I don't believe that I could, uh, uh, I could erase the scars of the past. But certainly I will not use the past as a hindrance to the future. We can't forever be looking at the rearview mirror. We're not going to see where we are going. And a lot of that has to be told to uh, people who still believe that the PNC is the, it's, it's the, 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 the monster, as the, the post-Jagan PPP leaders tried to sell uh, uh, all Afro-Guyanese as a kind of a zombie. You can't blame 40% of the people for political mistakes that might have been made. You can't lock them out of the political process. You can't lock them out of the governance. It's unfair, it's immoral, it's unjust. And now with us coming together for the first time in 60 years, we are seeing the possibility of bringing healing to Guyana, bringing unity in Guyana. And I have every confidence, and I say this today, that I've been long, um, 54 years. What were we driven by? Guyana one guy and it's gonna happen now mr. Granger in closing um, do you feel that your partnership with uh, mr. Moses Nagamutu is going to be a successful one in in the new Guyana come May 12th yes we have worked together uh, over the last three years in the National Assembly uh, the speaker of the National Assembly uh, uh, Raphael Trotman was the leader of the AFC he was elected on the strength of a vote by the Partnership for National Unity. We had collaborated on a wide range of issues in the budget. Uh, we agreed on the holding of local government elections. We were quite astonished at the refusal of President Ramatar to assent to certain bills that were brought before the National Assembly. We had to collaborate to support the uh, proposed motion of no confidence. So we have worked together very closely for the last three years. We're not strangers, we're not adversaries. And I believe we have a good foundation uh, to go. It, perhaps it didn't happen earlier for good reason, but on the 6th of December, uh, Cameron Dramjatan announced that uh, if FC was willing to enter into a form of pre-election coalition, 
and it was achieved on the 14th of February. I'm very happy and I'm very confident that the APNUAFC is not only the way for preventing the re-emergence of the winner-takes-all mentality, but it will form the foundation for a government of national unity. And this is what the Guyanese people want, and it will be um, the best means of ensuring the prosperity of Guyana. Yes, it will work, because Moses and David want it to work. So now, do you, f um, <clears throat> do you feel that having this partnership will ultimately um, diminish the discrimination uh, issue between the blacks and the East Indians in Guyana? Well, you have... Uh, you have fears of an insecurity in the society. You need to address that. We, we, I don't believe that we intend to avoid any of that. We, we are not going to erase things easily that this didn't happen, that didn't happen, but we're going to deal with the remedies to the, uh, to the problems. Look, let's take, for example, uh, the allegation that there were rig elections in the past. For 17 years, we had no local government elections under the PPP. Their slogan now is um, no elections are better than rig elections. So you don't have the moral authority with which you could point the finger to say that, look, bad thing happened in the past because you're doing that. It doesn't justify what you're doing. You have widespread corruption. Ralph Ramkaran, Joey Jagan, Nadir Gan, everybody ha have been talking about uh, widespread corruption, particularly in procurement and the way contracts are given out. We intend to plug that hole because a lot of money is wasted and going into the pockets of these uh, officials. We want to bring a public procurement act, uh, commission. Why is it that we have a law that calls itself, uh, that is called the public procurement act and we don't have a commission? Constitution provides for that. Why is this government, this government that says it is the epitome of virtue and, uh, and morality, why is it not setting up the structure to deal with corruption in public life? Why is it that the integrity commission that we are supposed to declare our assets to, why is it when you have Prado Ville 1 and 2 and people see ostentatious lifestyle that that commission is not allowed to function? So that we are going to remedy the problems that affect our governance in Guyana. If we have to look at the Constitution, I believe that David and I would have to deal with that issue in relation to, and the coalition as such, to see what is there in the Constitution that needs to be rectified so that we can have uh, more inclusion and greater participation of all the Guyanese people in the, in, the, in the political process. So that we want to, in moving forward, we want to be able to hold out guarantees that we could look at the judiciary, we could look at the, the separation of power and do not have political interference in boards and commission, in the police. Wherever you have political infer interference, you have a, a denial of justice. And so that we want to have a systemic approach to Guyana's problem, not simply in terms of list, look, looking at racial, the ethnic divide, but we have to also br bring the issues on the table and see what will be in the benefit of all of our people. And David did mention earlier about Amerindians and people living in the hinterland areas. They are part of our Guyanese society. Mm -hmm. And so we have to take move, uh, move a greater step to integrate people in the uh, Amerindian and the interior uh, location into the national life of the society. So that we have a comprehensive approach. And I'm sure uh, the programmatic approach that we are talking about would more be addressing issues than dealing with ethnicities so that uh, if you address the issues we'll be able to minimize the fear and the insecurity and perhaps marginalization as we know exists in the society so that we are confident that we will win these elections and the um, uh, uh, Guyanese in the diaspora they have a critical role because their views influence the opinions of people back home and so we would like them to call their friends and their families and say you have not nothing to lose you have nothing to fear. Granger and Moses, working in partnership, would symbolize your dreams and your aspirations that we will have a united country. And you're going to have to tell them to vote for the key <laughs> because there's this hand that we give you on the key that you could unlock your own future. You mm -hmm. could open up the, the path for your children and your grandchildren back home. Well, Mr. Nagamuti, you've summed that up very well in your closing statement. Um, and in your closing statement, Mr. Granger, um, do you think Guyana is ready for the change of uh, APNU and AFC coalition? Further, I say Guyana needs <laughs> an APNU-AFC coalition. 
I do not believe that the PPP has the moral authority to continue to lead Guyana into the future. We have the vision, we have a sense of mission, we have the support of the majority, and I do believe firmly that APNU AFC deserves to be elected as the government of the Cooperative Republic on the 11th of May, and we deserve to have the opportunity to give our young people uh, the good life that we have promised them. Well, thank you both, gentlemen, for being here and to uh, addressing the core uh, concerns and issues of our, our Guyanese diaspora. Um, you do have um, a very, um, I would say, very uh, difficult path ahead. Um, but again, with your perseverance and your commitment, uh, I'm sure that uh, you will uh, do well in leading the country in the direction it needs to go to. So all the very best with the upcoming elections. And uh, we look forward to having you again. Um, after May 11th uh, for another interview uh, with us as you speak to the Guyanese people here in New York. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you very much.